Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my midweek mystery series where today we have a historical mystery, the bread and butter of this channel. I just love a video that combines my two biggest interests and I'm pretty shocked I'd never heard about this story until fairly recently when one of you guys recommended it. This is a mystery that dates all the way back to the 1480s, predating the Tudor period. And it's not one that I'm sure will ever get solved considering it's now over 500 years old. The bodies of two missing young princes were discovered buried beneath a stone staircase in the Tower of London in 1674, nearly 200 years after the princes were last seen. Four years later, after a brief interlude where they were publicly displayed as part of a tourist attraction, the bodies were reburied in Westminster Abbey where they would remain until 1933 when they would be re-exhumed to be forensically examined. It's thought now that they were the bodies of the young princes, but what happened? How did they end up there? Apologies if the audio is really echoing in this video, I am moving out and the only things left in my entire flat are what you see behind me, so there's no furniture to like absorb the sound. I explained it all more in one of my last videos, so I'm not going to go through it again, but just bear with me for a bit. Of course, this video is sponsored by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. If you're a loyal viewer of my channel, then you'll already know why I love Magellan TV. So instead of listing all the reasons, this week I'm just gonna tell you about a documentary that I watched and loved. A brand new release on the platform called The Brain That Changes Itself. This is a bit of a two for one, as it's a two episode documentary about the human brain and how it works. Nerdy, I know, but oh, so interesting. For decades, for longer than that, it was thought by the world's best minds that the adult brain wasn't capable of change, that only children's brains were plastic and changeable. When I think about the brain thinking about the brain, it makes my brain hurt. It's very meta. New research showed that the brain can actually change in adulthood, which is huge when it comes to mental health research, what it means in the treatment of all kinds of mental illnesses, anxiety, OCD, schizophrenia, you name it. You hear in the documentary the stories of men and women whose own brains have been able to change and adapt to overcome physical and mental barriers. It's just an absolutely fascinating watch and as somebody who got diagnosed with her own anxiety disorder at the age of just three, I found it quite inspiring and hopeful. So for this video, I need to set the historical stage a little bit. It's the mid to late 1400s and the War of the Roses, a series of civil wars fought in England between the House of Lancaster and the House of York is raging. The War of the Roses was so named after the symbols of the houses, a red rose for Lancaster and a white rose for York, although apparently that is debated. I'm going to try and keep things simple here because this was a very bloody and very complex battle. But at the heads of the houses, when this very first started, fighting for their place on the throne were Lancaster's King Henry VI and York's Edward IV. Both men were direct descendants of Edward III, who had died around a century beforehand in 1377, and they both thought they were the rightful heir to the throne. At the beginning of the war, Henry VI was already on the throne and it didn't really help matters that he was mentally ill and being advised by some pretty corrupt noblemen and Henry didn't care all that much for politics, but he did like power. Henry VI had simply taken the throne by succeeding his father, Henry V, when he was nine months old. So Henry VI was not a very popular king to say the least. So around 1450, there was this big march in London, consisting of property owners and peasants from Kent who had been taxed heavily in recent years thanks to Henry's rule. They presented Henry with a list of demands, one of which was to recall Richard, the Duke of York, back to England. Richard was in Ireland at the time, and as the great-grandson of King Edward III, he also had a strong claim to the throne. Because of this, Henry became convinced that Richard was behind this rebellion, even though there wasn't really much proof of it, and from there, a rivalry would be born. 
In terms of who actually had the claim to the throne here, both houses, the Lancasters and the Yorks, did have claims. The Yorks were descended from the female relatives of Edward's second and fourth sons, whilst the Lancasters were related to Edward's third son. By modern standards, the Yorks' claims were stronger as they were descendants of the second son rather than the third, and we all know that the oldest gets the throne first, but the Lancasters at this point had held the throne for over 50 years already, so they like kind of knew what they were doing. Within the next couple of years, Richard would indeed return back to England and he decided that he was going to get rid of all of Henry VI's corrupt advisers. But then in 1954, Henry is said to have, in historical terms, succumbed to a bout of madness, leaving him unable to reign anyway. So Richard of York became the Lord Protector of England. He was essentially the ruler without the title of king. But then Henry suddenly recovered and took his place back on the throne. It was all very dramatic. Richard was pissed about the whole situation because now he wanted to be in power, so he organises a march against Henry at St Albans. This was not a peaceful protest. A battle broke out and Henry ended up getting wounded and captured by the Yorks. Richard is appointed as Lord Protector by Parliament. There's a few years of peace, ish, but then in 1460, Richard himself is killed in battle. The throne then naturally falls to his eldest son, Edward IV, in 1461. Edward then recaptures Henry again, who has since escaped from his last capture, and locks him away in the Tower of London. He then gets to work fighting and defending his title against anyone who said otherwise. So the Yorks are now in power. Sometime around spring-summer 1464, Edward IV would get married to a widow called Elizabeth Woodville. And this was a pretty controversial marriage at the time. Elizabeth came from sort of like minor nobility, her family were pretty middle rank, and she wasn't exactly the kind of person people expected the king to marry. She was said to be known for her beauty though, she was the most beautiful woman in Britain, and Edward was insistent on the marriage. They ended up marrying in secret, and the court did not receive the news well, as expected. I mean, it is said that the Woodvilles were famously Lancastrian supporters, just to add salt to the wounds. And Elizabeth's first husband had died on the battlefield whilst fighting for the House of Lancaster. But despite all the drama, Edward and Elizabeth were said to have a happy and successful marriage. They were together for 19 years and had 10 children, 7 daughters and 3 sons. Two of those sons are the main subjects of this video, the princes in the tower, Edwards and Richard. In 1470, there's a brief interlude in the peace-ish. When Henry was freed from the tower by his supporters, he was recrowned. Edward and his family flee, but then they return back from exile the next year to take the crown once again after winning at the Battle of Tewkesbury. It was very back and forth. Henry was then incarcerated in the tower again, and then he died. Which was great news for Edward IV, because it essentially meant that the Lancastrian line ended and that his two sons, heir Edward and spare Richard, were now in a great place to succeed him. Edward was invested as the Prince of Wales and Richard became Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York. Edward was given a very well-rounded education from there, he would learn a wide range of skills and he was set up for a really good reign. But then, on the 9th of April 1483, Edward IV died aged 41. It's said that he died of pneumonia, but nobody really knows for sure. What we do know is that it was very unexpected. Nobody was prepared yet for his son, Edward V, to take the throne because he was only 12 years old. Even in the 1400s, 12 was considered way too young to rule a country. Luckily, the king had been sick for a couple of weeks, and in that time he had had the forethought to designate his own brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, yes, another Richard, I'm so sorry, there's so many Richards, as Lord Protector. He would essentially be acting as the king, making all the important decisions until Edward V was considered old enough to start doing it himself. Importantly though, it's noted that the council is never bound to the wishes of a dead king. Once you're dead, you're dead, and people can do what they want. You can make your wishes and hope they'll follow them, but people are people at the end of the day, they're probably not going to. 
When the news of his father's death hit, Prince Edward was at Ludlow Castle and was immediately transferred to London, escorted by another one of his uncles, his mother's brother, Earl Rivers. His younger brother and the heir presumptive, nine-year-old Prince Richard, was also taken to London, just in case something happened to his older brother and he needed to take over. This was the 1400s, people died of anything very quickly. His official title was not Prince Richard, but I'm going to call him that for the rest of the video to avoid confusion between nine-year-old Richard and his uncle, Lord Protector Richard, who I shall henceforth refer to as Uncle Richard. Uncle Richard also didn't hear of his brother's death immediately. Obviously, news took a little while to spread back then, and he was in the north at the time. Elizabeth and her family had actually decided to wait until they sent the news to him because they wanted to be sure that their position within the monarchy and nobility would be protected in the new reign. But as soon as the news did arrive to him, Uncle Richard rushed to meet his nephew, the new king, on his journey down to London and escort him down personally. Almost immediately, the power went to Uncle Richard's head and he had Earl Rivers and Elizabeth's son from her first marriage, Sir Richard Grey, another Richard, executed. Just because he fancied it. When they eventually arrived down in London, Uncle Richard sent Edward to the Tower of London for his own protection. Elizabeth panicked as she knew that she'd officially lost custody of her son, the king, and she wasn't exactly the most popular in royal courts. So she gathers up all of her children, minus Edward, but including Prince Richard, and heads to sanctuary at Westminster Abbey. Elizabeth then watched as many members of her extended family and close supporters were executed one by one by Richard. Whilst in sanctuary, Elizabeth and her family were safe. But then Uncle Richard ordered that Prince Richard joined his brother in the tower. Despite Elizabeth's protest, she didn't have much power and she had to let him go and she would never see him again. Although sending the princes to the Tower of London does sound very ominous, that wasn't the case yet. It was simply a safe place where the vulnerable young boys could be kept an eye on and it's not like they were locked in the jail cells there. From what I can gather, they actually in the early days had free reign within the Tower of London, which is actually a huge place. They just weren't allowed out of the watchful eye of the guards until Edward came of age and took his rightful place on the throne. That was the idea anyway. Even though he was only 12 years old, Edward was still due a coronation. He was still going to be king. He was just going to have his uncle rule for him until he was old enough. His coronation was scheduled for the 22nd of June, 1483, and all of the regular preparations were underway. But somehow that morphed into a coronation for Uncle Richard instead. In mid-June, only a few days after the boys had arrived in London, Parliament declared that the princes were illegitimate on the grounds that their father had been contracted to marry somebody else before he married Elizabeth Woodville, making his marriage to Elizabeth invalid and any children born from that marriage ineligible for the throne. We all know rules like this were just sort of like made up back in these days. Although at the time this was enough to throw the entire line into question, it wasn't actually confirmed until an act of parliament until the next year. Regardless, Uncle Richard was officially crowned the King of England, Richard III, on the 6th of July, 1483. Yep, yeah, the same Richard III from the Shakespeare play. And Richard didn't just get the throne here by default because he was Lord Protector at the time, he legitimately was the next in line to the throne if the young princes were illegitimate, as Richard's two older brothers had both died, it naturally went to him. If you know anything about Richard III from your history lessons, you will know that he was not a popular king. He soon found himself with many enemies and he became paranoid, scared that somebody was going to take the crown from him. And after Richard III took the throne, nothing more is heard from the boys, the princes. The last existing historical reference made to the princes was on the 16th of June, in which it said that the children of King Edward were seen shooting and playing in the garden of the tower. What happened to them after this point is subject to a lot of speculation. 
According to the Italian chronicler and diplomat Dominic Mancini, soon after they were last seen, the young princes were withdrawn to the inner apartments of the tower and day by day began to be seen more rarely behind the bars and windows until at length they ceased to appear altogether. Already there is a suspicion that they had been done away with. It was suspected that they were removed from the garden to the White Tower, which is where royal captives tended to be held, according to rumours that Mancini had been hearing at court. It's believed that at some point over the coming weeks or months, Edward was regularly visited in the tower by a doctor, who reported that Edward had prepared himself to die. He knew this was coming, and this was a 12-year-old boy. He made daily confession and penance in preparation for the afterlife. There was an attempt at rescue in the July that failed, and then the boys disappeared, rumour being that they were murdered. By who? Well, that's the question. It was never answered at the time, and as the years went on, people just forgot about their existence altogether. It was actually 30 years before there was any real account of the disappearance, in an unfinished biography written by Sir Thomas More, Henry VIII's Chancellor, called The History of Richard III. In this version of the story, Richard III, Uncle Richard, was portrayed as the perpetrator, having ordered the two boys be murdered by servants. This version of history says that Richard III sent a man called John Green to the constable of the tower, Sir Robert Brackenbury, with an order to kill the princes. Brackenbury refused, so the king selected a man called Sir James Tyrrell to carry out the order. Tyrrell couldn't do it himself, so he appointed two other men, Miles Forrest, one of the boy's keepers, and John Dighton, his own horse keeper, to carry out the deed. It's written, the innocent children lying in their beds, Miles Forrest and John Dighton about midnight came into the chamber and suddenly lapped them up among the clothes, so bewrapped them and entangled them, keeping down by force the feather bed and pillows hard unto their mouths, that within a while smothered and stifled they gave up to God their innocent souls. They were suffocated. It's said in the biography that in 1502, Dighton was examined and confessed to the murder of the boys. These were his words. However, despite this version of events being portrayed as truth at the time, it was probably more fictionalised than people were led to believe. Some even think now that Dighton and Forrest never even existed. In general though, this account from Moore was taken as the truth. It was believed for many years that Richard III was to blame for the death slash disappearance of the princes, the number one suspect. These rumours started almost as soon as the boys disappeared and would cause much rebellion against Richard in the coming couple of years. And this idea of evil Richard III would only be further pushed when Shakespeare would write his play, Richard III, showing him to be some sort of caricature villain. Shakespeare was inspired by the story of the Prince in the Tower to write this play. It's also worth bearing in mind that, as I said, Sir Thomas More was the Chancellor of Henry VIII, and Henry VIII wouldn't have been much of a fan of Richard III. In August 1485, just over two years after Richard was crowned, the Lancastrian Henry Tudor staked his claim to the throne and met Richard on the battlefield at Bosworth. Richard III was killed in this fight and legend goes that the crown was placed on Henry Tudor's head right there on the battlefield in the exact spot that Richard had been killed only moments beforehand. Lancastrian Henry Tudor became Henry VII and he ended up marrying Elizabeth of York, putting an end to the decades-long War of the Roses, uniting the two houses. Henry VIII is obviously the son of Henry VII and therefore Henry VIII was Lancastrian by blood. He wouldn't have been the biggest fan of Richard III and presumably neither would his Chancellor have been. Of course they would have wanted Richard portrayed negatively. And when Shakespeare was writing Richard III, his play, he was writing it first and foremost to please Elizabeth I, the great-granddaughter of Henry VII. The play was designed to make Richard into a villain, possibly more so than he really was, or maybe not. But regardless of all of that, it does make sense that whilst he was alive, Richard III wouldn't have wanted the princes around. 
As long as the princes were alive, the paranoid and suspicious Richard III would be worried that they posed a threat to his claim to the throne. Although they had been declared as illegitimate, there was always a chance that this could be reversed. We've seen it time and time and time again throughout history. Claims to the throne are like a yo-yo. I'm sure their deaths would have been a great relief to Richard III, whether or not he was the one responsible. There have been many people over the years who have disputed this version of events who don't believe that Richard killed his nephews. Plenty of people name both the unfinished biography by Moore and Richard III by Shakespeare as nothing more than Tudor propaganda. Perhaps Uncle Richard wasn't really as evil as history has made out. However, a more recent study by Professor Tim Thornton of the University of Huddersfield has suggested otherwise. Thornton has concluded that Moore had inside knowledge when writing his biography, and therefore his version of events may be more believable than some may think. As I mentioned earlier, some people doubt the existence of Forrest and Dighton, the men who supposedly did the dirty work, committed the murder, saying that Moore made them up to be fictional characters. But Thornton has found that Moore may well have actually been in touch with the sons of one of the men who said he killed the princes that these men named by Moore did really exist. It should be recalled that Moore described his sources for what happened to the princes not directly as the confessions obtained when Tyrell and Dighton were brought to the tower in 1502, but what he had learned of them that much knew and little cause had to lie were those two noble princes murdered. Thornton has found details of the existence of Miles Forrest, or more specifically details of his death which came by September 1484. The king actually made a grant to Forrest's widow and son. It was harder to establish the existence of John Dighton, it seems, but we're focusing on the existence of Forrest here. Records would apparently show that Forrest's sons would grow up to work closely with royalty. One son would be a groom of the chamber in February 1511, and another son would be in the service of Margaret, Queen of Scots, Henry's sister. They would remain in close service over the next couple of decades, so it's not insane to think that Moore, Henry VIII's Chancellor, could have come into contact with them more than once. He really may have had conversations with them about their father's involvement of the murders of the princes. What some think to be a made-up story may well have some legs after all. But there is another reason why the Tudors may have been quite happy to have Richard III framed in the murders of his own nephews, because the other big suspect is Henry VII himself. But what would have been his motive for this? As I mentioned before, Henry ended up marrying Elizabeth of York, unifying the two houses for good. Well, Elizabeth of York just so happened to be the sister of the missing princes, Edward IV's daughter. Even though Henry was Lancastrian, a lot of Yorkists actually strongly backed his claim to the throne, purely because of his promise to marry Elizabeth. In order to complete this union, Henry would have had to have undone the illegitimacy of all of Edward IV's children. Henry VII had no blood right to the throne. Although he was Lancastrian, he was illegitimate through his mother. He won his place on the throne through bloodshed and divine intervention. And it may well have been argued that through his marriage to Elizabeth and his undoing of the illegitimacy, the prince's blood right to the throne was reinstated and their right then became superior to that of Henry's. And Henry knew that the York's porters would much rather the brothers on the throne than him. There's actually even one theory about how Henry VII was designed to become king, specifically to get revenge on Richard III. One Tudor historian called Polydor Virgil describes how the prince's mother, Elizabeth Woodville, was given news about their deaths. She tore out her hair and screamed in grief. Elizabeth wanted vengeance, and it was Henry's mother, Margaret Beaufort, who suggested how she could get it. If she promised marriage between Henry and her daughter Elizabeth, they could reunite the Lancasters and the Yorks and bring Richard down once and for all. It is known that in the months following Richard taking the throne, Elizabeth Woodville would suck up to him quite a bit because she was in a very dangerous position. If she wasn't on the side of the throne, then her and her family were dead. 
But maybe there was more to it than that. Maybe she was purposefully trying to get onto the inside. But that's just speculation. It's also interesting to note that when Henry became king and married Elizabeth, there wasn't any huge search for the bodies of the two princes. He didn't hunt down people who might have known what happened to them. He didn't go to the tower searching for them. Their fate was simply left a mystery. We're following the popular timeline of events here that the princes died in the summer or autumn of 1483 at the hands of Richard III, or at least Richard III's cronies. But let's say that the princes did survive, that they didn't die that year. Maybe once Richard III became king, there was no reason for people to keep track of where the princes were anymore. Maybe they just slipped through the cracks. Maybe they lived in anonymity. If they did happen to survive until 1485, there's no denying that Henry would have had the motive to want them gone. There is one account that some say suggests the princes may have been alive as late as July 1484, with regulations issued by Richard III's household stating that the children should be together for breakfast. Now, had it been known that there were definitely no other children in Richard III's household, then this could have been some solid evidence. However, it is also thought that Edward, Earl of Warwick, and Edward IV's two youngest daughters were also living under Richard's care at the time. So in my opinion, this isn't much evidence of anything. I also don't think it's too likely that the princes did live in anonymity for two years. I think if Henry VII did kill them, he had no reason to do so before he became king. He didn't become king until 85, the princes were last seen in 83. I don't know, it doesn't quite add up, in my mind. Although Richard III and Henry VII are the two biggest suspects in this case, there are a couple of other possibilities as well that historians consider. There was another man called Henry whose name has been thrown in the ring, Henry Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham. He was a very close supporter of Richard's when he took over the throne, but by the November of that same year, he had turned against Richard and Richard had him executed. Why? Some suspect that he found out that Richard had killed the young princes and turned against him, but others suggest that Henry was the one to kill the princes in what he thought was a favour to help Richard out. When Richard found out, he lost it and they fell out big time. There's not much evidence of this, but then again, there's not much evidence of any of this. It happened over 500 years ago. It is thought by historians, though, that if Henry did commit the murders, it's highly unlikely that he could have done it without Richard's prior knowledge. You can't get much past the king, and they were highly, highly guarded. Then there's a theory that they were killed by Lady Margaret Beaufort, Henry VII's mother. Again, not much evidence, but the hypothesis is that Margaret killed them to ensure that her son got the crown. It was a two birds, one stone kind of situation. She knew that Richard would be the prime suspect, that he would lose support, and then when Henry took the throne, he would gain that support and the princes wouldn't be there to overthrow him. Smart if you think about it. But then again, there's no actual evidence and Margaret was never accused of doing this by anyone at the time. The boys were kept securely in the innermost rooms of the tower and they were guarded at all times, so she wouldn't really have had a way in, and nobody really had a way in. In 1674, 200 years after the alleged murders, builders unearthed the skeletal remains of two people 10 foot below the foot of a staircase in a wooden chest. On the orders of King Charles II, they were demolishing what remained of the royal palace to the south of the White Tower. When writing his original account of the prince's disappearances, Sir Thomas More had written that the bodies had originally been buried beneath the staircase, but were later moved on Richard's orders. But these bodies were found underneath the staircase, and they were declared to be the bones of children of the missing princes. And after a slight hiccup, when they were put on display at a tourist attraction for a few years, they were then interred in Westminster Abbey. Could it be that the bodies had never been moved from the stairs as per Richard's orders? Or could these have been the bodies of other people, other children? The two bodies lay in Westminster Abbey to this very day, although there was a brief interruption in their peace in 1933 when they were exhumed and forensically examined. It was concluded then that the bodies did indeed belong to two children, their ages estimated at 10 and 12 which do match up with the princes. The bones haven't exactly been looked after over the years, they've been moved a lot, so it was hard to find solid evidence. 
But this examination has been criticised in the years since, saying that no attempt was even made at the time to determine whether the bones were male or female, nor if there was a cause of death other than suffocation. The examiners went into this expecting that they were the bones of the princes and therefore that's what they found, it wasn't very subjective. Since then, so like 90 years ago now, no further scientific examination has ever been conducted on the bones and they remain at Westminster Abbey. DNA analysis has not been attempted. As we know, the remains of Uncle Richard III were discovered in a car park in 2012 and they are confirmed 100% to be his remains. Could we do testing against his DNA and find any familial match? He was the uncle of the boys after all. Permission to conduct this testing has been consistently refused over the last few years, but maybe they'll get lucky one day. But let's say, for argument's sake, that the bodies aren't those of the princes and they belong to some other poor children. What happened to the princes? Some think they managed to escape the tower either by themselves or they were smuggled out and given new identities. Some think that Richard survived until adulthood but Edward soon succumbed to ill health and he would never make it to adulthood. Rumours of the boys escaping have persisted over the centuries and if they did escape it would make sense they would never confess their true identities. A lot of people want to be king but maybe these boys were smart and thought I'm not going to try to go after the throne, I'm just going to try and live an easy life, as easy as it could be in the 1400s. I mean they probably would have been swiftly killed if people knew who they were. One version of the story even says that they were given new identities as builders in Colchester. People took advantage of the potential escape stories with one young boy in 1487 posing as Prince Richard, emerging out of nowhere to claim his birthright to the throne. The boy's name was really Lambert Simnel and he bore such a resemblance to the missing prince that even some family members were convinced, but he was simply a puppet in this whole thing, it eventually came out that he was an imposter and Henry VII spared his life, putting him to work in the kitchens. There were multiple stories like that in the years following. I suppose it would have been much easier for the boys to live in anonymity in the 1400s than it would be nowadays. Most people would have no idea what they looked like and they would be pretty hard to recognise. All in all though, I must say I'm most convinced that good old Uncle Richard is the one responsible for the murders. It makes the most sense, it's the simplest explanation. This was clearly a guy who had his sights set on the throne and he wasn't about to let anyone get in his way, even children, even his nephews. Plus he was the king, he could get away with murder, who was going to stop him? But I suppose this is one of the rare murders where I'm going to say we're probably never going to get a solid answer. Maybe one day if they allow the genetic testing to take place we might find out if the bodies really were those of the princes, and if we're going by Moore's account of where the bodies were originally buried this does match up with the Richard III theory, but still then we'll never know for sure. We can take a good guess though, so what do you think? Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.